Buddha had only two teachings that he said were categorical. In other words, true across the board in every situation. One was that skillful qualities should be developed and unskillful ones should be abandoned. And the other was the Four Noble Truths. Stress, the cause of stress, the cessation of stress, and the path of practice leading to the cessation of stress. Now both of those teachings have built-in imperatives. The first one is obvious. If something skillful comes up in your mind, you want to develop it and you want to nurture it, help it to grow. If something unskillful comes up in the mind, you want to learn how to get rid of it. With the Four Noble Truths, the imperatives are in his first sermon. Stress is something to be comprehended. Its cause is to be abandoned. The cessation of stress is to be realized, and the path to cessation should be developed. You can probably see the connection between the two. The cause of stress is to be abandoned, just like unskillful qualities. And the path is to be developed, like skillful qualities in general. The reason these teachings have imperatives built in is because our mind is constantly acting. We're not just sitting here passively receiving things. We're shaping our experience, and we need direction in how to shape it wisely. Because the reason we suffer is because we're shaping our experience of sight, sound, smell, taste, tactile sensations in unskillful ways. We relate to the world as a whole in unskillful ways. both in figuring out what we want out of the world and how we go about it. And because the mind is active, it needs directions in how to act skillfully. A lot of people come to Buddhism and they don't like hearing this. They'd like to hear that you know, there's nothing to gain, there's nothing to let go of, just, just sort of be in the present moment and accept whatever happens. Well, that's an instruction of one kind, but it doesn't really get you very far. If you're really neurotic, that's a way of getting some rest. But the Buddha wants to take you further than that, to a point where there really is no suffering in the mind. The mind is totally free, totally without limits. And that requires work. And so we have to learn how to deal with the mind, all the unskillful habits we have. This process of self-regulation is something that has to be learned. We talked about this today in the class. Think about the committee of voices in your head telling you to do this, not to do that. And they have lots of different ideas. And learning how to not listen to the unskillful voices and to listen to the skillful ones and to recognize which is which. That's a real skill. A lot of discernment goes into that. It helps to have good examples of people who can live by the teachings and not get all tied up in knots. But you also have to learn how to sort things out on your own. So for the time being, as you're sitting here meditating, okay, any thought that has to do with staying with the breath, take that as a skillful thought. Any thought that wants to pull you away and take that as something that's unskillful. And then there are relative levels of skill in both of those, because sometimes the thoughts that tell you to stay with the breath shout at you, and they shout at you for a good reason, because your mind is going to slip off into something really unskillful if you don't pay careful attention. And other times they shout at you in a way that gets you discouraged. So you have to keep them close watch on what the voices are saying, how they're saying it, how you react, and try to develop as much as you can a really matter-of-fact attitude towards what's skillful and what's not. So if you catch yourself doing something unskillful, you don't get yourself all tied up in knots around it, and yet you are able to let it go. 
that's the sense of just right that you want to develop. The same with skillful qualities. You want them to encourage you to keep you going, but not to push you so hard that you break. This is why the Buddha talks about the path as being a middle way. That the voices in your mind, the, the imperatives that you tell yourself, are wise and they're just right. They get the results you want. That's how you know that things are balanced and really are following the middle way. You tell the mind to settle down, and it settles down. This is going to take time, and there's going to be a fair amount of back and forth, and you have to learn patience. A lot of the Ajans in Thailand noticed that when they were getting Westerners to come study with them, the two big problems they had were patience and equanimity. And so they taught a lot about those. Now some people came away from those teachings thinking that that was all there is. Actually, those are the beginning. When the Buddha was teaching Rahula how to meditate, the first thing he taught him was make your mind like earth. Disgusting things get thrown to the earth, but the earth doesn't react. Make your mind like water. Water is used to wash away dirty things, but the water doesn't react or get disgusted. Make your mind like fire. Fire is used to burn up garbage, but it's not disgusted to the garbage. Make your mind like wind. Wind blows dirty things around, but the wind itself isn't disgusted by the dirt. In other words, you're going to meet up with things that you don't like, both in the body and in your own mind. And you have to learn how to accept that so you can work with these things. Because the Buddha didn't stop right there. Then he taught Rahula breath meditation. And that involves a fair amount of proactive working with your breath, learning how to breathe in a way that you're sensitive to the whole body, learning how to breathe in a way where you're calming the effect of the breath on the body, learning how to breathe in a way that gives rise to a sense of rapture and refreshment in the body. Breathing in a way that gives rise to a sense of pleasure and ease. These things don't just happen on their own. You have to engage in some trial and error until you reach a point of trial and success. So you use patience so that you can observe things carefully and develop this matter-of-fact attitude. If something doesn't work, okay, it didn't work, try something else. There's a story I read about years back. There was a famous swimmer who was going to compete in the Olympics, and they were hoping that he was going to sweep all the medals. And in the first race, he didn't. He came in second. And people were afraid, well, that's it. He's just going to go into a downward spin from here on in. And the coach said, don't underestimate him. And sure enough, he went ahead and won the gold medals in all the remaining matches. It's because he didn't let that first match get him down. He knew how to spring back. And so when you find yourself doing something unskillful, either in the way you're focusing or in, in the way your mind is talking to itself, because it's so easy to say something unskillful to yourself and then you got, get upset about what you said to yourself and then get upset about that, and then it just keeps snowballing. You've got to learn how to put a stop to that. Learn how to step back. Say, well, I'll just breathe through it. Try again. Try again. Maybe part of the problem is that our culture is a very unforgiving culture. You have one shot at making it in society, they usually say. Of course, it's based on a religion that gives you one shot. You've got this one lifetime, and then there's going to be either eternal reward or eternal damnation, which is a very unforgiving frame of thought. This is one one of the reasons why the Buddha's teaching on rebirth are so helpful. You don't make it this time, we've got another chance. Now the other chances may not come for a while. As the Buddha said, your chance of being reborn as a human being is right away is pretty slim. But at least you've got more chances. And it's not some arbitrary person up there who's going to damn you forever for one little mistake, or praise you, or reward you for one little change of heart. Karma is a lot fairer, a lot more fair that way. And it gives you a chance to start over, start over, start over. It's 
to learn to think in a way that, okay, you make a mistake and it's a mistake. Recognize it as a mistake, but it's not something that's going to cause you trouble forever. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and then try better the next time. Try better the next time. Try to develop that ability to spring back and to cut through a lot of the recriminations that would tie you down. This is probably the secret to self-regulation. In other words, having some patience, having some endurance, having some equanimity about what you're doing. At the same time, having the confidence that the skills that you're being asked to do can be done. The Buddha wouldn't teach anything that human beings can't do. Sorry, Buddha was the one who said that. If, if it were impossible to find happiness through developing skillful qualities, the Buddha wouldn't have said to try to develop skillful qualities. If it were impossible to abandon unskillful ones, he wouldn't have taught you to do that. It is possible to do these things. And whether it takes a lot of time or it's just a little time, we're not here racing with one another. We're working things out, each of us, within ourselves. So if things are taking time, don't get down on yourself for that. Just remind yourself, okay, I've got one more chance here, another chance, and then another one, then another one. Keep trying to do it better and better and better as you can. And keep a sense of humor about this. I told you the story before about the, the Englishman who went across the Northwest Territories back in the 1820s with a group of Dene. And he noticed that on the days when the hunting was bad or they couldn't get enough to eat, those were the days when they joked among themselves the most and knew how to keep their spirits up. So do your best to keep your spirits up. This is an, another important part of self-regulation. Because even though you may have a teacher here to watch you and to give you advice, you're the one who has to internalize it. And the results are going to come from your efforts, and particularly your ability to exercise your powers what the Buddha calls vimangsa, which is the active part of your intelligence, checking to see what's working, what's not working, and then trying to figure out new ways to make things work better. It's the discernment in the practice. As he said at one point, your ability to get yourself to do things you don't like doing, but you know are going to give res good results, or to stop yourself from doing things that you like doing that you know eventually are going to give bad results in the long term. That's an important part of wisdom. Usually when we think about Buddhist wisdom, we think about fairly paradoxical and abstract things. but the real wisdom starts right here. Your ability to regulate your own actions, to follow the imperatives that the Buddha set forth, i.e. to develop what's skillful and to abandon what's unskillful. That way you take the active part of your, your mind, the part that really is aimed at goals, really is aimed at accomplishing something and use it to your advantage. I was listening this evening to a French TV program where the Buddhist teacher was talking about the effort of no effort and the effort that involves not having any goal. And I keep wondering, you know, why on earth are people attracted to this? Why do they want to be told there is no goal, that you're just perfect as you are? I guess it's, it's kind of a laziness. It's kind of a reaction to the unforgiving and goal-driven nature of our society. But when you can step back from that from a bit and you begin to realize that there really are problems in the mind and they really do require work, and here's a good set of instructions on how to deal with those problems. As the Buddha said, his imperatives are conditional. If you want to find true happiness, this is what you have to do. He's not forcing them on you, but he is saying that 
if that happiness that you want, if you're really sincere in your desire for happiness, you've got to buckle down and bring all your intelligence in learning how to do this with skill, with finesse. So you don't run yourself into the ground on the one extreme, and you don't just kind of wander off in, in the clouds on the other. You want to stay on course in this ability to be self-regulating is one of the essential factors of the wisdom that will get you there. <laughs>